The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. The nation has been riveted and some have said completely fractured by the ongoing saga of President Trump's nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. As everyone knows, there was a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing last week and a California psychologist offered compelling testimony about an alleged sexual assault by the nominee 36 years ago. For his part, Judge Kavanaugh vehemently denied the allegations and subsequently, the committee recommended a week-long FBI investigation. We brought a retired Supreme Court justice and a Manhattan College political science professor to the program tonight to provide some analysis, commentary, and historical perspective to this volatile and controversial situation. So please join me in welcoming from Manhattan College political science professor Margaret Gork. Nice to have you with us and a former presiding justice of the commercial part in Bronx County. It is Judge John Barone. Nice to have you with us, sir. Um, Professor, let's start with you. Give us some historical context. Is this as strange and different and unwieldy as it feels for so many of us? Or is this really, well, these kinds of things happen in judicial nominations? Well, we've had both. We've had nominations that sail through after a staid hearing and get 96 to 0 votes. And we've had others that have been big conflicts. We've had Nixon had two of his nominees voted down by the Senate. Um, we all remember the uh, Clarence Thomas hearings, which were very similar to what we're going through now. Um, and, you know, George W. Bush uh, nominated Harriet Myers, and, you know, the conversation immediately turned to whether or not she was even qualified, whether she had any judicial experience, and her nomination was, was withdrawn. So, you know, it's, it's uh, perhaps one of the crazier ones, <laughs> but there have been crazy ones before. Um, in, in, uh, in, in this case, in terms of, um, you know, somebody with sexual harassment allegations, do you think in the past uh, it would have, he would have been, or the president would have immediately withdrawn the nomination, or do you think because the politics are so difficult, so fraught with you know controversy right now, uh, that uh, that's one reason why Republicans and the president are holding the line when there are so many questions being asked? That's a really hard Tough one. Question. Yeah, uh, um, y you know, if you think back to the Clarence Thomas hearings, despite you know what I think we look back on now and say was you know ver a very credible allegation that uh, sexual harassment in the workplace had happened, um, uh, that nomination went through. So to, to say that in the past, you know, it would have been drawn back. It's Trump doesn't say. like to lose. Trump likes Clearly. to, you know, if he's going to find his way out of this situation and, and choose another nominee, um, I think he's going to have to find some way to make it a victory for himself. He, he's not going to want to say, gee, if you don't like him, Right. I'll find In another words, appropriate if, nominee. If he's going to lo and, and we'll talk about that a little later because they, they did change some of the dynamics of what the, the prospective FBI investigation will be. Um, but I, I, I think that if, if, in fact, he's going to ultimately withdraw the nominee, he's not going to be forced to do it. He's going to say, you know, I kind of wanted to withdraw it anyway, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Um, Judge, uh, thank you for joining us. Let's talk thank a you. little bit about uh, the case. If, if you were presented as, as a judge or a jury that you were presiding over, we presented a case of a sexual harassment allegation 
much like is going on here, and you saw what the testimony is like, and there were two others in the background that would suggest that there may have been a pattern of behavior. Um, how do you think that case would go, or is that not even fair because this is not a criminal case or trial? Um, well, e either criminal or civil, because we have them in both, uh, both venues, right. criminal and civil cases. Um, were this a case, the, uh, the uh, attorney who uh, held on to a witness, knew about the witness, continued with the trial, and then uh, on the eve of a, of, of a charge to the jury, uh, disclosed a, a, uh, a witness. Uh, so you're, you're suggesting, and, and because it's been said, that Senator Feinstein had some information. Is that well? That's what it's, it's, it seems to be. I mean, it, you know, this is this is the facts that we're all right. getting. And she, so. of course, is not uh, uh, you know uh, Christine Blasey Ford's attorney. But right. you're saying here is somebody who knew about the case and didn't do any preparation well, for as it. As I say, uh, but the, but was asked not to. Like if someone gives you information and says, don't I don't want it. you to. Do anything that this. Right. What are what are you supposed to do? Right. But well, that makes it a non-traditional case. Go yeah, ahead, right. Judge. No, you 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 either must disclose if you're the attorney. If you're right. the attorney, and but we're not in a criminal case. Well, right. I understand. And she's not that. the attorney. I understand that, yeah. but I'm I'm presenting it in right. this way. Yeah. The 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 attorney uh, who who received the information uh, would have been had two obligations: one to ask for a closed hearing in front of the court. Mm -hmm. uh, to apprise the other side of this new evidence. And if they had not done so, uh, you probably, if it were a serious case, uh, you probably would not have dismissed it, all right? Uh, what you might have done was you might have declared a mistrial or you might have adjourned hmm. the case. Because of information that That's was... That's right. So, so when... Um, uh, 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 when uh, Rev uh, I'm just going Reverend Flake, that's somebody else. <laughs> when Senator Flake, uh, you know, came out and said, "I was a prosecutor. You know, I've been in courtrooms. This one doesn't, uh, you know, uh, pass the smell test." Basically, maybe that's true, but this, after all, as the professor said, is not a criminal case. It's not, but I want to analogize it just briefly, you know, to continue the analogy. So what the judge would have done was, if there were a request for a mistrial from the, from the opposite party, mm -hmm. based on new evidence mm -hmm. in the possession of the other attorney, right. uh, and not disclosed until the eve of, let's say, uh, jury charges right. or, uh, you know, or, or summations, he would probably get a mistrial. Mm -hmm. Because you would be afraid, a judge would be uh, concerned that if the judge took a verdict, it might be reversed on appeal. So what, what you're basically saying is what Senator Flake reacted to and what many people have reacted to. She made a very compelling case. And then, of course, people who support um, uh, Brett Kavanaugh say that he made a very right. compelling case. Um, what's your thought, uh, Professor, about the relevance of all of this legal material and, and people like the judge and other legal minds weighing in saying, well, gee whiz, you know, is there a case here? Is that relevant in the selection or should it be relevant in the selection of a uh, Supreme Court justice? In other words, do you need a conviction or, you know, we're talking about a Supreme Court judge here? I think what we're trying to do here is determine whether the president has chosen a good person to sit on the Supreme Court. And, you know, leaving aside whether any particular person would share Judge Kavanaugh's politics or judicial philosophy, I think it's important. You, you look at someone's judicial temperament, you look at their honesty, you look at their ability to, you know, I think he, uh, he said himself in the first stage of his testimony before the committee, um, you want someone who's going to be uh, kind of a fair umpire. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the senators need to be looking at a number of things that question whether this is really the best person that, that the president could put forward. Uh, so, and, and you haven't mentioned any of those uh, you know, sexual abuse allegations. You're saying as a person, is he presented Well, I right? think the, the sexual abuse uh, allegations are one very serious element that mm -hmm. I think, you know, 
we have to take in, into consideration. Um, I think, you know, some of his testimony before the committee about other things more recent in his life, in his work, uh, was not entirely truthful, and I think that's uh, a problem. There have been questions raised that have not been answered about his financial situation, where somebody who makes $225,000 a year pays off $200,000 in debt in a single year without anything right. reporting, you know, so that he won are, the lottery or that he, you uh, know. And I think all those things are the kinds of questions that lead one to, to just wonder whether this person is the appropriate kind of person to, to put on the court. I, we're going to go one step further with the FBI investigation. That's when I'm going to bring the judge back in. But I want to show this quote, which came out of uh, an NBC News article written by someone named David Brock, who had been an associate of uh, Brett Kavanaugh's uh, in, um, uh, in, in some of their previous work. And it really was very revealing because he talked about Brett Kavanaugh not in the, in, in the context of being a judge, but of being, in essence, a GOP political operative. I think we have the quote. We can put that uh, up on the screen. Um, but uh, Mr. Brock said, Brett and I were part of a close circle of cold, cynical, and ambitious hard-right operatives being groomed by GOP elders for much bigger role in, roles in politics, government, and media. Kavanaugh was not a dispassionate finder of fact, but an engineer of a political smear campaign, and that was uh, directed at Bill Clinton during, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the impeachment hearings and the impeachment investigations with Kenneth Starr. Does this, just the fact that, not that Mr. Brock said it, but that was his previous job and work, in your mind, does that make it so, you know what, this is not somebody who, if something comes up there, he's got a, an ax to grind, so to speak, which no judge can have, let alone a Supreme Court justice. I mean, it, it's one of those things, somebody who worked, you know, David Brock is somewhat more famous for doing that kind of thing than, than Brett Kavanaugh is, and you do wonder how much that, uh, that past leads him to be the kind of person who's going to dispassionately hear cases, some of which might be intensely political and others of which have nothing whatsoever to do with politics. Um, it, it, it's certainly not something, if I were looking for Supreme Court nominations, I wouldn't look for people who had been through that. During the hearings the other day, you know, uh, Kavanaugh very angrily said, um, as he was complaining about being attacked and his reputation smeared, he said, what goes around comes around. And I thought, you know, he's the one who wanted right. Clinton to detail in, in testimony all of his sexual uh, misbehavior. Right. And it's like, so in a way, what, what goes, goes around, around has been coming did, around. did yeah. come around. To me, that would certainly suggest uh, that, um, you know, what goes around comes around, that he would have kind of an ax to grind and you, no Supreme Court justice can can have that. Uh, Judge, I want to get back to you about this idea of an investigation. Now, just today, um, uh, frankly surprising to me, the president said, let them interview anybody they want. Uh, so now they'll be able to do that, but they've got to do it in a week. So talk to me about uh, the reality, num number one, what can they find out and the reality of finding out information that would be relevant within the seven days, and I don't know when the week starts, maybe it started today, I, it's hard to well, say. Well, you, you might grant an adjournment. You would charge the other side. In other words, you would fine, essentially, the other side for this delay in the court, and you would, and you would, and you would compensate. Really? Yes, absolutely. And let me just say one other because thing. Because now they've raised the idea of an investigation. Yeah, me, Although, certainly in this case, it's not a, it's not a criminal case, so that's not no, going to apply. Not, it, it was, no, it, in a civil case as well, you would do that. Yeah. I, I think that this case was mishandled, and I'll, that's the most charitable word I can say, by Senator Feinstein's office. Yes. You think she knew about it, and even though she was asked, as pr the professor said, even though she was asked, don't do anything with it, she should have brought it out she, in a different way? She should have gone to the, to the witness, to Professor Ford. She should, have, she should have informed the chairman of the, of the committee in camera that she had information of a confidential nature that she wished to disclose to the other side before the hearing proceeded. In other yeah. words, to bring this up at the last minute and was, and, and to have it leaked, 
you, is that's you a think big that, problem. That she that that she should have just listened to uh, Dr. Ford and not done anything. You know, because I, I know you brought there's it up two before. things that I, I think about this. And I'm going to pursue this FBI thing, thing, so you know, don't go away. <laughs> one thing I think about it is uh, there's an awful lot of focus on whether this was raised in the right way, and I think the more important thing is whether this man tried to rape this woman 36 years ago and in fact may have tried to rape other women. And that's more important than whether it was brought Procedure. up in the right day. And the second thing I want to say that's is... That's why you had to bring it up as soon as you could. Right, but also if somebody tells you something in confidence and doesn't permit you to share their information, I think you're in a little bit, I mean, you can be as persuasive as you can with that I, person I, and say you have to let me go, fo go you, talk you, to you somebody about this. You think that she I, was duty-bound to do I, it? I, I, I do. And if she could not, and I'm not saying you can't respect the confidentiality of the other witness. If she could not, then you can't bring the witness. Uh, FBI. And it was leaked by, by, by somebody, either, either in the congressional office or the senatorial office. It was leaked. Or by, a, by an attorney of some sort. That was the allegation that or, 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 or by her. But, but if her attorney did that, that would have been, that would have been a, a, a violation of the canons of ethics of her As, attorney. Assuming did. that you couldn't, you know, you're not going to get an adjournment. Certainly they, they seem, certainly the Republicans seem hard and fast to the one week. Um, what information could be useful? So in other words, they, they haven't confirmed the location of this party. They, you know, they, I think one thing I read was that they could get uh, uh, floor plans potentially of where it was so then to verify her memory and those. Can that be done in a week? Yes. It can be done. If there, are enough, the if there are enough agents in the FBI assigned to the case, mm -hmm. yes. I, unlike, you know, I know in certain political instances the FBI has become under uh, criticism, particularly in the Mueller investigations, but this isn't that. This is to run down a story. And they may be one of the best agents in the agencies in the world to do it. And it's, it's, it's a, limited, uh, a limited group of witnesses. Um, as to the other allegations, I would say one seems stronger than the other. I won't, I won't say which, which one. I, mean, I was always going to ask you, what information, let's, let's do it this way, what information could you, I mean, I realize we're doing speculation here, would you see that would make you say, aha, it certainly seems like uh, uh, Judge Kavanaugh was in that room and did that, or to say, you know what, she doesn't remember it well enough. It, you know, you know what I mean. You know, what, what is the kind of thing is, that would convince a jury the, or a judge or anybody? This is the normal way that that kind of information is dealt with in court. You let the witness testify, and you subject the witness to cross examination. Now, if it's, a, if it's a civil case where the, the right to remain silent uh, doesn't apply, where you've got to prove your case one way or the other, right. uh, then the, after the cross-examination, after the, after the uh, direct examination and the cross-examination of the surprise witness, then the, the um, I don't know what you want to call them, the plaintiff or defendant in this yeah, case. It's not yeah. a case, but I, right. so it's hard to identify the parties. Then there would be an opportunity for that witness to uh, call, uh, to, to attempt to refute the charges. I must say one more thing. Well, I, I still want to get into that. What, and what would convince a jury or what would you, in your mind... You know, that's a, that's a in funny other words, thing. Like if, let's say they do come up with, the, it, you know, and they, they uh, verify her memory of the place, of the location of some of the people who were there, and they can put those people in there, plus the question of when she went to um, uh, Mark Judge and supposedly met him in, at his place of work, if they can confirm that he worked there, you know, during the time that she said, well, would that be convincing in some form? I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an example that has nothing to do with this. <laughs> Are you there's okay? A, there's a witness on the stand, and she testifies. This it was a woman in this case. She testifies as to what she saw. And uh, I think it was an old, old Bronx attorney, Sam Musho, a very fine attorney, long gone, but a uh, great, okay. great Bronx attorney. And uh, Sam noticed that she had indentations on her, on her nostrils, on the upper. From glasses. From glasses, right? And uh, so he said, now you went right to the window, right? He didn't, he didn't go any further. He says, and, and, and you saw it. And how many fingers do I have now? You know, four. Right. Uh, he says, so basically verifying you her never know what's gonna You never know what's going to... I'll tell you, if, if right. I may, if right. I may... I want to get back to the politics of I'll, this, I'll, I'll tell you what might uh, have, have... I don't think the anger of, of uh, uh, Judge Kavanaugh 
was that damaging to him. Mm -hmm. What was damaging, I thought, and might, might impress a jury unfavorably, was uh, the way he responded, uh, particularly to uh, Senator, um, there's a woman senator, I believe, Harris. from Minnesota. No, not oh, Harris. Uh, no, Klob no, Klobuchar. Harris. Klobuchar. Klobuchar. Klobuchar was, uh, Senator Klobuchar was trying to be as, as reasonable as possible. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and he still expressed anger. No, he still he, he came expressed anger, and he so, talked about drinking too much. Uh, I, I, I'm going to hold. He asked the, her if she drank, right? Didn't yeah, he ask right. her if she that's blacked right. out? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, let's let's because it's not a criminal proceeding. It's not a legal case. Um, what about the politics of it now? So as I mentioned uh, today, the president said, uh, "Go ahead, investigate anybody you want." Do you think he's backing off it right now? Do you think he's saying, "You know what?" This really, we may not be able to get this through reasonably. An investigation may show something. And so I'm going to, what we said earlier, he's going to step himself out of it and then just pick somebody afterwards after he says, you see, I agree. We, I wanted the investigation. And, you know. Well, I think they're, they're trying to establish that they're creating a fair investigation. I mean, the idea of first having a, you know, a, a time limit and, a, you know, and, uh, limit on scope. who they're allowed right. to talk to is plainly ridiculous. You don't you don't tell the no, NYPD point, investigate a, a murder and but here's the people you're allowed to talk <laughs> right. to. Right? No, a judge would do that. A judge would a say, judge look, would you, you got a week. We're gonna re we 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 we're gonna we're gonna adjourn the case for yeah, a but week. But he, they're not gonna tell but you. But he, would he, he wouldn't if, he or she of course wouldn't limit the scope of who you could talk well, to. Well, you know what? The power would be similar to that of the president. You could, but you would not. And you the wouldn't. president is not You wouldn't not doing because it. you wanted to get to the truth. That's like, right. if That's the right. cop met somebody who might know something, you would want the cop to, to, to interview Absolutely. that person. Right. Absolutely. So, uh, but I think the president doesn't want to look overtly unfair. Uh, and, and it's not going to be in his interest to look overtly unfair. And, and lose the situation, Professor, which he may, may lose. May, may I make a, and you, sure, you, tell me, you tell me what you mm -hmm. think. I don't think that anybody knows how the politics of this are going to shake out. And well, I think so, we're and, getting a clue and, at the moment. And, and, so, and so I don't think that the president has a lot invested in, in, whether, uh, in, in, in whether Kavanaugh eventually is confirmed. Well, I think he did, but I think his statements today showed right. that he was back I, in office. Let, let me ask you this. You uh, take your career in law very seriously. You take your position as a jurist uh, very, very seriously, undoubtedly. Um, if you knew what you know about Judge Kavanaugh's background, what I suggested before, that he had been a political operative, that um, there are some questions about whether he had been totally truthful, whether the White House held uh, thousands of pages of documents, and um, uh, he behaved the way that he behaved, would you be comfortable with that uh, person ascending to the Supreme Court? You know, judges come from all different uh, backgrounds. That, that, I, I loaded that question. I, I'm aware I, of that. I mean, <laughs> but I, mean, I did that deliberately because oh. it's. I think it's reality. I think if you take the politics out of it, anybody in the legal field would have to say, "Wait a minute, what is going on?" Well, you know, the Federalist well, we'll Society. Let, sure. Well, let's let him answer, and then we'll, well give you some historical you know, perspective. know, judges come on the state side, particularly. A fellow leaves the the, the city council, becomes a judge, a uh, identified with a particular constituency. District Attorney of Bronx uh, County became a judge. Right. Uh, the, uh, and the judge took his place as the district attorney. I know all of them, Rob Johnson, Darcel, Clark. Of course, Clark, sure, uh, of course. But so judges come everywhere. It's not, it's not unusual for, for them to have something in their background like that. Unusual then for a Supreme Court justice? Well, you, you I mean. Documented cases where it worked we've, and where We've it lately work. had a lot of discussion about whether the process for picking judges in the Bronx ah. is a particularly good one. We'll leave that one aside for the moment. But we're picking a Supreme Court justice. We're not picking, you know, somebody who's going to. Uh, Rule on civil cases right. in the Bronx. And, and so Court. I think it's particularly important that we look at what's that person's background and what's their temperament and what's their ability to make these really important history-changing um, decisions. You know, I, I totally agree with Judge Barone. The politics of how this is going to play out are a little bit unknowable, right? Um, uh, the recent polls from Pew show that um, the two issues that most people say are influencing their decision-making process right. in the midterm elections are Medicare and judicial nominations. That's pretty rare that judicial nominations are would that be high. that high. 
and it's much more on the Democratic side. It's about nine points more well, on the Democratic they, they side than the Republican side. They certainly would have some more to be concerned about, having lost the last one, and then they'd lose so another. So you do wonder, like, what's going to happen? Like, how is that going to influence turnout? Well, give, give me a, we don't have a ton of time. Give me a, a suggestion of how you might reform this process to take some of the politics out of it and be able to get the a... The Supreme Court process? Yes. Oh, Lord. Not enough time in the day, or you're not sure? No. Yeah, uh, okay. I don't think you ever take politics out, even appointed judges. In the, well, in the Bronx, certainly. Oh, well, goodness. you know what? The Bronx <laughs> We've had it the I, last two I, weeks. We've had it. I, yeah, well, obviously. But I, I, in some ways, prefer the Bronx situation to the Manhattan situation. Well, now, why would that be? The Manhattan situation is a free-for-all. And every judicial candidate has to run around to all the political clubs because the county leader will not control the convention. That's since, at least since Denny Farrell. I don't know uh, okay. before Denny, but Denny Farrell and, and did not. So you're saying it's a simpler process yeah, in the Bronx. it's a simpler process. Well, and, and in some ways, it's a fair Fascinating uh, perspective, of course. Uh, you know, who knows if you could ever take uh, politics okay. out of it. But to me, one of the biggest issues here in terms of the politics is the country is so divided and there is such polarization yeah, yeah. Uh, starting literally at the top and then there's also resentment from the Democratic side over what had happened with Merrick Garland. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's important to remember we're replacing the swing vote on the court for the last long number of years. So that's an additional factor that makes this especially that, like a divided. And so in, in some ways, um, Merrick Garland, who was seen as more of kind of a moderate who could please both sides in some fashion, that's not at play here. So there will not be a swing vote, it, presuming uh, Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed or even logically whoever the right. president uh, suggests. It will be five to four. I got the numbers right. Yeah. It will be five to four. Almost regardless, you know. Um, Want to make predictions? Anybody? How do you think it's going to play? Well, you're talking, I would say, you, you, you correct me, Professor, you're talking about four or five senators. You're talking about Manchin, and you're talking about uh, the three uh, Do, Well, senators. you know what? We're just about out of time. Does it hinge on what is found out on the, on the it investigation? Could. It's very, very well put. Yeah. Similar thought? It, it, it should. I think people should look at all those other things, too, but it will probably hinge on what we find out this week. Gee, I wish we could just debate it, negotiate it, and solve the problem. We could. Uh, Judge uh, John Barone, thank you so thank much you for so joining much, us. Mr. And Brown. Professor Margaret Grok, thank you for joining Happy us. To be here. And folks, if you have further questions or comments, who doesn't have comments on this, on uh, anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You send us a tweet at Bronx Talk or you post them on our Facebook page and we'll read them on the air during a future edition of our program. You can check out our archives at bronxnet.org. Dot org. You find Bronx Talk by following the watch menu on the new BronxNet website. Next week, we delve into Bronx development. Can the Bronx be developed without causing displacement and making it so that Bronx people who have lived here can actually benefit from that development? We'll have two developers here with us, one private, one public, here to analyze the possibilities. And a one side note, next week will mark the 24th anniversary of Bronx Talk. Many, many years and many great programs like this one. We thank our producer, Helen Greenberg. Our director is William Guzman. And we thank Nick. We thank the cast of thousands. We thank you, and we'll see you next week. Good night.